rest of us, let's turn now to Matthew chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 16 through 24 this morning from Matthew's gospel. And if you would, please stand with me as we read God's word together. Hear the word of the living God. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. This is the word of the living God. Please be seated. This morning's sermon is called, You Do Not See Because You Will Not See. And the emphasis there is on the word will and the exercise of the individual's will in opposition to God. And what we'll see in this text is that Jesus is going to deal with unbelief. He's going to confront unbelief, and he's going to confront it hardly. It is not going to be an easy confrontation. Jesus does not coddle unbelief as so many in this world do today. Jesus calls it what it is. It is a rejection of God that leads to everlasting peril and ruin. Unbelief is no friend of the soul of any man. And Jesus is going to teach us. But in order to understand what stands behind what Jesus is teaching here, we have to keep in mind what he taught us last week in verses 7 through 15. And so if you were here last week, you're in a good spot because hopefully you have at least some recollection of those things. But in verses 7 through 15, what we saw is that the promised one, the Messiah, unto whom all history had been pointing toward and preparing the way for, has now come, the age of expectation, as it were, the age of anticipation, the age of the old covenant, had prepared the way for the age of fulfillment. And Jesus Christ, the one to whom it had all been pointing, has now come. And therefore, in greater light, clarity, and power than in any age prior, the truth of God's word was now being confirmed before these very people to whom Jesus is talking But don't think that the confirmation stopped with Jesus' ascension. That confirmation has continued into our very day, which is why this passage is a very sobering one for us to consider. We stand in the same age as those whom Jesus confronted here. We stand under the same bright light of clarity concerning who God is as they themselves stood now, I want to share something with you briefly from Romans chapter 1, 18 through 20. We read those verses a little earlier. Let me just read them again and point something out to you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Why? Because God has shown it to them. 
For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. And the result then is so they, all men, in every place, in every age, in every culture, of every ethnicity, all of them stand before God without one single excuse for not believing in him. Thus says the word of God. And what is shocking and what should shake us to the core is that the Word of God says that about the work of creation alone. The fact that you wake up and are surrounded by an ordered, designed universe that God has made with the breath of his own lips, that he has spoken forth in power by divine command itself, if that's all you had, if you had nothing else, is enough to show you that you have no excuse for not falling before God in worship and seeking his face. That's what the word of God says to every single man. Now think with me about where Jesus stands now. Has has the work of creation been the only work God has done to reveal unto sinful men who he is and what they need? Is that all God has done? Did he only make the world and leave us to sort it out the rest of the way? No, from creation on, God has continued to work. He has continued to reveal himself. He has continued to speak and to act and to demonstrate that he is the Lord and that you, dear one, need him. And it is in that backdrop that Jesus is speaking now. He's saying, if all you had was creation, it was enough to condemn you for not turning to God. But look what you have. You have the entire old covenant. You have the whole age of expectation. You have Christ himself, the King and Lord, God in the flesh, standing before your face, calling out to you, repent and be redeemed. And your hearts are so hard. They are so stony and evil and wicked and rebellious that you would look in the face of your maker and say, you're a demon, you're a glutton, you're a drunkard, your friends are tax collectors, you're a nobody. I won't listen to you. That is what Jesus is saying in this text, and you must feel the weight of it. Do not hide from the weight, the cumbersome weight of the Spirit of God speaking through the Word of God for your salvation. Do not ignore the Word that comes to you this day. Unbelief is not the result of a lack of information from God or of clarity from God or of light by which men can see the truth. People will tell you, well, I just can't see it. There's just not enough evidence. God just hasn't made himself clear to me. He hasn't made himself known to me. Jesus says, not one of those things holds any water whatsoever. Unbelief is the result of an unwillingness in the sinner's stubborn heart to acknowledge the truth which has been plainly revealed. Did you, did you realize when I read from Romans how many times it was they suppressed the truth, God has shown it to them, it is plain to them, it's been clearly perceived. You see how out of the way the Bible goes to say it is not a lack of evidence, it is unwillingness, it is stubbornness in the sinner's heart that rejects what God has revealed plainly to all and therefore refuses to repent of their sin and submit themselves to God. You see, it is not, it is not that men cannot see the truth. It is that men will not see the truth. They do not want to see the truth. They hate the truth. They reject the truth. They suppress it. They make up excuses for it. They come up with false things like evolution to try to talk themselves out of the plain reality that we live in an ordered, designed universe that it bears every testimony of coming from the wisdom of one who perfectly crafted it. They deny that which God has made abundantly plain. And they do it because they love their sin. Why do people hate the truth and reject God? Why do people 
cling to their unbelief and come up with all kinds of reasons for why they do it because they hate God and they love their sin. Does that sound harsh? Let me read to you from the lips of Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 19. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. You see, it is not that men cannot see the truth. It is not that God has not made it plain. It is not that it has not been revealed. It's that wicked men are in bondage in their will to their sin and corruption and will hate and mock and reject the truth until their everlasting ruin, unless God intervenes on their behalf by his sovereign mercy and grace. This is the condition that all men in every place are born into as the offspring of Adam. And Jesus is confronting this willful rejection and unbelief in the souls of men. And what we'll see in the following here, as we now zero in on our text today, is that Jesus will confront this unbelief in three particular ways. First, in verses 16 through 19, he will show us the obstinance of unbelief. In verses 20 through 22, he will show us the willfulness of unbelief. And in verses 23 through 24, we'll see the vileness of unbelief. Let us work through this now. In verse 16, Jesus raises a question. To what shall I compare this generation? He's saying, what is, what, what is a, a comparison that is going to help make sense of what it means that these people are refusing to repent, they're refusing to come to me and be saved? What is it like? And he says that it is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. You see, Jesus compares this generation to discontented children who, though richly provided for, simply will not be pleased. We sing one song for you, and you'll say, oh, that's my favorite. Well, we sing it for you, and what do you do? You say, well, I don't like that one anymore, so we'll do another one. Okay, we'll play that one for you. Well, I don't like that anymore. Well, anybody who's raised children knows exactly what I'm talking about. They know exactly what Jesus is saying here. Sometimes children get obstinate, don't they? No matter what you do, you can offer them their favorite thing, and if they're feeling obstinate and rebellious, they will spurn it and reject it. And that's what Jesus is saying the people of this generation are doing. No matter what God has provided to them, they find some excuse, some reason to reject it and say it's not enough. It reminds me of the words of Isaiah chapter 5, which we also read earlier in the service. And in the beginning of that text, it says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. And listen to the way the prophet describes the nature of, of God's people in their rebellion to him. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. First, God has given his people a fertile place for their growth. It's not as though they're in a desert and he's saying, why aren't you bearing fruit? He said, they're in a a fertile place where their growth should come easy. He dug it and cleared it of stones, planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it only yielded wild grapes. Notice this list. He's basically, he's saying, I have done everything that could have been done to help you, to bless you, to provide for you, but you have obstinately opposed to your submission to my will again and again. And he says then in verse 3 of Isaiah 5, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. And here's the question that echoes, I think, what Jesus is saying in our text today. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it? That's the question, isn't it? That's the question that Jesus is raising against this generation. You see, in God's tender kindness, he has sent messengers to this sinful world who have played the gospel song in every varied key, to use the illustration of the flute and the dirge. 
The truth has been sung to a tune that suits the ears of every man. Look with me on the on your notes here if you're following along there and see this list. God has graciously revealed the way of salvation. And look at this with me. Covenantally, ceremonially, sacrificially, legally, morally, historically, angelically, musically, prophetically, providentially, miraculously, and now with Christ coming in the flesh incarnationally. Look at the list of all these different ways God has manifest the truth to the world and said, return from your sins and be saved. And what has the world done? We will not believe. You see, no matter how the gospel has gone forth, no matter what manner of truth it has been proclaimed or plainly presented or divinely confirmed, these sinful men have obstinately refused to believe. This is the reality. This is the state of the world. This is what sinful people are like apart from God's intervening grace. They will look God himself in the face who's offering them life and they will give him the finger and tell him to get out of their way. That is the wickedness of the sinner's heart and that's what these people were doing to Jesus. And that, my dear ones, is what so many in the world today are continuing to do. And Jesus is addressing this unbelief But before we get to a little further in the text, notice how they deny. This hasn't really changed. You see, in the text we see at verse 18, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they had something to say about that, didn't they? Well, he's got a demon. It couldn't be that he's actually holy and sincere in his devotion to God. He must actually just be some demonic person. He's got got a demon. And then Jesus comes eating and drinking, and they say, look at him a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You see, instead of submitting to the truth, sinful men invent all kinds of reasons for arrogantly dismissing it. And haven't you seen this again and again and again in the field of psychology, in the field of science, in the field of anthropology, in the field of sociology? We see it everywhere. People get degrees just so they can invent foolish ways of sending themselves to hell. That's ridiculous. They spend years writing and reading books that teach them how to continue rejecting God's offer of grace. That's how obstinate, that's how willful is the rebellion of sinners against Christ. And he is confronting it and saying, what should I compare you to? Every possible thing has been done for you. Every possible bridge has been built. Every possible path has been laid. Every road is open. Every opportunity is yours, and you will have none of it. You will cling instead to the illusion and the lie that the truth has not been made absolutely plain. But Jesus declares, in fact, it has. The second thing he'll show us here, well, is the willfulness of unbelief, beginning in verse 20. Let me read it to you. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Notice this. Notice what Jesus just said. You have had front row tickets to God Almighty in the flesh, coming down and standing before your very face, working supernatural miracles that no human being has ever done or could ever do. You stood there, feet away from him. You looked at it. You saw it. You heard it. You smelled it. You tasted it. And you looked at him and said, get out of my face. Leave me alone. I won't believe. That's what Jesus just said. In the face of every provision, they will not repent. They will not turn from their sin to God. They will cling to it and they will die for it. That is the reality of what Jesus is saying. But we must notice something. The ground of judgment here is because they did not what? Repent. You see, so often we think that the the main ground of God's judgment against us is the amount of our sins. Of course, there's some truth to that. But notice what Jesus says here. He does not 
base the judgment on the fact that they have sinned too much to be forgiven. They've, they've, you've just messed up too bad. You've done too many things. You're too evil. You're too wicked. You've made mistakes that are too hideous for me to forgive. He doesn't say that at all, does he? He looks at wicked, guilty, hideous sinners who have rebelled against him their entire lives, who have spat in his face, as it were, and he says, if only you would have turned from these things, I would have forgiven all of it. The reason that they will be condemned is not because they have sinned too much, but because they refuse to let God bless them with his mercy. They refuse to receive what is freely held forth. They refuse to eat at the feast of grace that God has prepared in Jesus Christ for sinners who are hungry and famished and lost without that heavenly bread. They refuse to turn from their sin. Why? Because they love their sin and they hate God. The Bible plainly declares that God will save every sinner who comes to him in faith. The problem is not that God is unwilling to be merciful, but that man is unwilling to come to God for mercy. Do not let this world hold up and say, well, God is just cruel. He, how could he be so harsh in his judgments? You know, I, I just can't ever serve a God of wrath, a God of justice, a God of judgment. Those are all more of the same lies. No one goes to hell because they were begging for life and God said no. They willfully reject the free offer of the gospel of grace which is held forth to the world. They have no one to blame but themselves. And that is how Jesus views unbelief. He says in verse 21 and 22, "'Woe to you,' which is a pronouncement of judgment." Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Jesus now uses a comparison to show the utter willfulness of the Jews' unbelief. And what he does here, you may not realize right away, is he uses two Jewish cities and compares them with two Phoenician cities or Gentile cities. And we sometimes miss this in our modern day because we don't think very covenantally. But these Jewish cities, they were born surrounded by every possible means of grace to teach them and instruct them and point them to God. They were born in the most blessed covenantal heritage that they could be in to be pointed to the truth, to be pointed to the Messiah. Those in the Phoenician cities had none of that. That's, keep that in mind because that's what makes Jesus' comparison here so powerful, okay? But store that for a moment because I want to set this up just a little bit more. He's using this comparison. And again, his point is to show the willfulness of the Jews' unbelief. It is not that they have not been shown the truth. It is that they do not want to see the truth because they do not want to forsake their sin and submit to God. Let me give you an illustration of this, which I think will hit home for most of us. Uh, this has happened to my wife and I a number of times with my two boys here in the front row. It's bedtime for the kids. It's been a long day. We've been working hard. Mom and I are tired. We're just ready to relax and have a few minutes before we ourselves go to bed. And so we've put our children to bed, but... As children sometimes do, they're still stirring, and they get out of bed, and they begin to play, and they're wrestling in their room, and from downstairs, you know, you can hear the, the stomping sounds, right, of their wrestling, and you know, we know as parents, we are aware, we realize what's happening, we know they're awake, we know the truth, they're moving around, but at that same time, we don't want to know the truth, do we, because we're tired, and if I know the truth of what's happening, I have to get up and go do something about it. And I don't want to go do something about it. I want to lay down. I want to rest. I want to relax. That would really be inconvenient for me to have to deal with what is plain and obviously true. Do you see the connection? That is what Jesus is saying here. It is not that you don't know. You know it, but you know what it will cost. You know that in order to acknowledge Christ as king, you must acknowledge your sin as wicked and evil and part from it and no longer make excuses for it and no longer come up with all kinds of cultural stories 
to try to convince people why it's okay to suddenly be a man who calls himself a woman or a man who sleeps with another man or fill in the blank with all the very things we're seeing in our own culture right now. Plain truths, obvious truths being denied boldly. Things which are undeniable. It is not that people don't know what's true. It's that they want to reject it. And so here, what Jesus does is he says of these Jewish cities, if all that a person had, remember that covenant heritage that they grew up in, Jesus, but he's saying even the people who had none of that would have turned if they saw the things I've done. So what Jesus is saying is, if all that a person had were the mighty works that I have done in your midst, They would have more than enough to confirm beyond all doubt that I am the Lord of all and that you must repent to be saved. But you Jews, whom I have chosen above all other peoples on earth, you have been given the greatest bounty of blessing. You have been given my covenants, my law, my temple, my sacrifices, my priesthood, my feast, my promises, my prophets, all of which pointed forward to and prepared the way for my coming. Yet even now, as I, Yahweh himself, stand before your very face, you continue to willfully spurn the truth. You will not repent. That's what Jesus is saying when he compares these Jewish cities and their hardness of heart, their willfulness and their unbelief to these others. He's saying you, among all the people in the world, have the most reason to be quick to turn to me. But you, more than all people in the world, have been stiff-necked and you have set your face in opposition to the living God, to your own everlasting peril. Jesus is is saying here that he has made his identity so clear and so plain that to deny it is like a person standing on a 14,000 foot peak on a cloudless day at high noon declaring, I cannot see the sun. I said that to you last week. It's still true. It's like a person who's marching through the Sahara Desert saying, I just can't find any sand. It's a person sailing the Atlantic who says, you know, I'm looking around, but there's just no water. It's so obvious. It's so plain. It's so clear. The Messiah has come. He has demonstrated by word, by power, by prophecy, by promise. He's the king. He's the one. But you won't receive him. And neither will you acknowledge that the reason you won't receive him is your own heart. Instead, you find fault with God and you blame him and say, he has not done enough. He hasn't made himself clear. He hasn't shown me the way. He has shown you, dear one. He has shown you what is true. Jesus then says in verse 22, I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. This is the lips of Christ. He just said there that not all punishments are exactly the same, that there is worse sin and worse judgment for some sins. That's very important. He says that those who have the greatest light and yet refuse to believe will face the greater judgment from God. Those who have the greatest light and yet refuse to believe will face the greater judgment from God. You see, all unbelievers stand guilty and will be judged. But those who willfully refuse to believe in the face of greater light and opportunity will face a more severe punishment from God in eternity. And we need to think about this together for a moment. Can the same not be said of our generation today? Think soberly with me. Think about the age of light that we live in. Think about how accessible the gospel is, how accessible the Bible is, how accessible a church is, how accessible the truth is. Think about where you live. Think about what is within your grasp at any moment, in your pocket. You have 375 billion different versions of the Bible to choose from for free right now in your pocket. How much light do we live in in this age? And what is Jesus saying about those who have great light? They have no excuse. 
And when they turn in hardness of heart from God, they will face the greater judgment. Beloved, there's a church on every corner. There's a Gideon's Bible in every drawer. There are websites, sermons, apps, videos, podcasts, conferences. What excuse will an unbeliever hold up to God in the day of judgment? Please tell me what it is. What will you say as you stand before the living God, naked and exposed with all your sins laid out before you? What will you say to God when you have spurned him and rejected him with your life? What will you say? Will you say to him that he has not done enough for you? He hasn't made it clear to you? You didn't have access to the truth? Will you say that to God? Because if you will, you will be laughed out of heaven. If you try to charge God with fault by saying he did not do enough, he did not make himself plain, you will be laughed out of heaven. God will say to you, I sent my very own son to you. And when he came, he not only preached the word, but he confirmed that it was true, that it was a message from heaven by healing the lame, by cleansing the lepers, by giving sight to the blind, providing food for the hungry. With his own voice, he spoke to storms and told the waters to be still, and they listened. He spoke to a dead man, dead for four days, and he said, rise. And the man rose from the dead and came out with his grave clothes on. He walked on water with his own two feet. What will you say to God for your unbelief? What defense can you raise? What attorney will be able to adjudicate you in the court of God? You will stand there as a foolish, foolish fellow. As you stare down the corridors of an eternity of misery and torture and torment for your sin in hell with days without end because you spurned the wisdom of God that was given to you and freely offered, will you turn? Will you behold the grace that God says is here? Will you lay hold of it? Will you stop playing at religion? Stop playing at church? Turn to God and be saved. This is the Christian message. Jesus says, if you are willful and spiteful and obstinate, you will face the greater judgment. You are warned this day of these truths. What more, what more could God do for us than he has done? Finally, Jesus concludes by showing us the vileness of unbelief the vileness of unbelief. First, in verse 23, he addresses a very common misconception. Verse 23, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? Capernaum, the citizens of Capernaum, apparently held the view that they were good people who were on their way to glory. They thought, you know, we're, we're, pretty, good, we're pretty good people. We're good citizens. We, we don't, you know, I don't, uh, what is it, uh, cuss, Chew or steal or go with girl. Oh, no, that's not the one. Um, drink, smoke, or chew or go, go with girls who do. Isn't that like the old line? Uh, that, sort of that's the whole morality, the, the religion of morality that calls itself Christian and will go to hell because it is not rooted in Christ. Is that where you are? Are you a good uh, citizen? Are you a good Republican? Are you a good person? Of course God's going to welcome you to heaven. You're a nice person. You don't do any of those terrible things. You've never done time in prison. You're a good person. Jesus is raising the question to people who think that God owes them heaven. He's raising the question to people who think, you know, I'm really pretty good. And he's saying, do you really think you're going to go to heaven based on your merits, your work, your performance? Are you that foolish and blind? Have you listened to nothing the Bible has said to you? Have you never read the law of God, which indicts you at every syllable? You will not go to heaven based on what you do. There is one way to be saved. There is one Messiah. There is one King. There is one gospel. There is one salvation. It is in Christ. And the people of Capernaum who are right now living in unbelief and rejecting the Messiah, he's saying, are you nuts? Do you really think you are going to be welcomed by God when you reject his son? Christ is the Savior. Christ is the Savior, and anyone who does not have Christ will be sent to hell forever. We must be clear on the truth. 
Rejecting Christ is rejecting the Father and the Spirit alike. You cannot have Christ. You cannot have, rather, the Father or the Spirit apart from Christ. You cannot have life apart from Christ. You cannot have forgiveness apart from Christ. You will be separated from God forever if you reject him. Jesus says, you who think you will be exalted to heaven, you will be brought down to Hades. And then he says something that I think is shocking. And we need to pay close attention here. Notice to whom he compares in this final verse. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Now, hopefully you know something about Sodom because it will help you understand how shocking Jesus' statement is here. Sodom is one of the most vile cities in all history. It was a seedbed of perversion, homosexuality, incest, pedophilia, adultery, rape, the most vile and evil things that I don't even like to say out loud in this sermon. This, all of these were defining of Sodom. They were defining of the culture of Sodom. They are becoming more defining of the culture we live in today. Jesus holds up Sodom. So vile was the evil of this city in God's eyes that he made it a special point to utterly destroy it. You can read about this in Genesis. Abraham pleads for Sodom, and God says, if you even find just a few people there who are not obstinately and willfully and vilely rejecting me, I will spare the whole place. But he could find none. God, in his mercy, saved Lot and his daughters, but the rest faced the righteous judgment of God. And what makes this so shocking is, is this reality of how vile Sodom was. This is what makes Jesus' statement shocking to us because it is against the backdrop of this hideous picture of some of the most flagrant and grotesque forms of sin that Jesus holds up the sin of willful unbelief in the age of Christ's coming and says such unbelief is more vile still. Do you see that in the text? Who will face the harsher judgment? Those who cling to their homosexuality or pedophilia or adultery or transgenderism or other things? No, he says the ones who will face the harshest judgment are the ones who had the greatest light and clung to their unbelief and rejected God. That's what Jesus just said. The harshest judgment is for those who spit in the face of God's clear and plain testimony of the truth in Christ. And if you are someone who is rejecting God, you have every reason to be squirming in your seat today. I hope you are dreadfully uncomfortable. I hope you can't sleep tonight or tomorrow or the day after that until you are right with the Lord. Because you will stand before God. And Jesus is not the wimp this culture tries to make him. He says you will be judged if you reject him. And so I hope that you are uncomfortable because you are guilty and judgment day is coming and you will soon stand defenseless before the God whom you have willfully rejected. Turn to Christ. But this last statement has one last thing for us to see. It should also be a comfort to us. How on earth could a verse about our sin of unbelief being worse or more vile than the sins which define Sodom. How could such a verse be a comfort to us? Here's how. Because it means that there is only one sin which is ultimately unforgivable. There's only one sin that is ultimately unforgivable. No matter what other evils you have done or are doing or are hiding right now in your life, hiding from your wife, hiding from your husband, hiding from your parents, it is not hidden from God. He sees you naked. He sees your heart. He knows you. You are not fooling anyone. But no matter what those things may be, whether they have been done in the past, they're being done now, or will come in the future, there is only one sin that will keep us from entering heaven. 
And that is the sin of refusing to repent and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only sin that will keep you from the gates of heaven because Christ has paid for the sins of his people. If you receive what he offers to you, you will be forgiven. You will be redeemed. Beloved, the sin of unbelief is a sin which you can forsake right now. It is a sin that you can turn from in this very moment if you are willing to do so. So why would you cling to that which God has shown you will only lead you to ruin? Jesus Christ is the Savior of every sinner who calls upon him. Repent and believe the good news. Let me pray.